on to why you're actually here, Rhea. Um, Rhea works as a, wow, <laughs> technical architect and lead software developer to, for VML, a global brand and customer experience powerhouse agency headquartered in Kansas City, Missouri. She provides logical, analytical, technical, and strategic direction to help internal and external development teams deliver high-quality web-based experiences. Also, shout out, she just got her MBA from Rockhurst University last week. So, woo! go Rhea. So let's discuss the benefits of re reviewing code, what it is, what it isn't, and how to make it more than the blind rubber stamp approvals we've grown used to. Rhea will show you her process and things that have helped her cultivate totally awesome code reviewers because let's be real, everyone needs a code review. So let's give it up for Rhea. All right, so getting good or better at code reviews. Thank you very much for the intro. It was fantastic. And y'all got to celebrate my masters with me because that two years, whew, whew, I'm glad it's over. But it was so much fun. But now I get to get back to the things that I love to do, which I like sharing information with people. I want us to be our best, and I love for us to deliver high quality solutions. I'm passionate about this topic. So passionate about this topic. It's the only thing I've been talking about for the past year. So first, before I get started, let me get a show of hands. I'm just trying to get a feel of who I've got in the audience. How many people are student, very new? Gotcha. Mid, maybe, you know, you're like on job two, three-ish. Yeah, okay, and then do I have any like senior? Excellent, excellent, and does anybody count as like an executive, like a, do I have any C-suite level folks in here? Okay, just trying to get a good gauge, trying to get a good gauge. Well, I am Bria, I am at the fake Riri on Twitter because the real Riri was taken when I was trying to make my Twitter handles. I am a leader of devs at VML. They gave you like the whole little bio. That was adorable. I didn't know it was gonna happen. But yes, I'm also an ambassador for Kansas City Women in Tech. If you, hey, I heard some woos. Some people know who those folks are. Um, it's an awesome organization in Kansas City. We are not just for women. Um, it started off as something, a way to get women into technology and then a way to get children interested in tech careers. And now it is about serving who needs to be served. So please come through if you are ever in Kansas City and catch one of our lovely tech talks. Um, women and not men, sorry. People that identify as women and identify as not men, please come check us out at Coding and Cocktails. It's a very safe space for learning how to code and figuring out if that's what you want, how you want to do it, and volunteer with us. Can you stop sharing erasure? Oh, shut up. That's excellent. Thank you. Woohoo! We're back. So bear with us, sister. Bear with me. Okay, so we talked about that. I told you who I am. I told you about Kansas City Women in Technology. I am also your code review queen. Yay. This is me. This is me. And I like asking questions and I like getting feedback from my audience. So who here of folks that rose their hands, and maybe you didn't earlier, but who reviews code? And when I say reviewing code, there's different types of code review, right? There are, as you can do like group code reviews, you can do demo days, you can do some other types of sharing of code with other people. I am specifically talking about pull requests also, I've heard them called merge requests. So when I say code review, I mean a PR. So who reviews code? Excellent, excellent, excellent. However, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, I think everyone should do it. Why? Because if you write code, you should review the code. And if you write code, you should review code. You are the gate. It's your code base. You own the code that goes in, and if you are the one that's going to be maintaining it, you might want to close the gate sometimes. Now, I'm just saying. So when I talk about code review and what it is, we talked a little bit about the fact that I mean pull requests. These are some of the things that I hear from people about code review and what they think it is. They think that it's something that is for the code owners, the team leads, the more senior people on the team. 
Um, I've heard that it is about the quantity of eyes. You know, you got to get as many eyes as possible on this code because we need at least two sets of eyes on every line of code. And I've heard that it's, you know, kind of focused on the developer. And I have heard that it's an optional process. I would like to express to you how fully, wholeheartedly, I completely disagree. So for me, I think that code review is for us all, by us all. Instead of foo boo, it's foo a boo -a. <laughs> It's definitely not about the quantity of the eyes, it's about the context of the eyes that are on the code. So if you wrote it, you probably shouldn't be the one reviewing it. I mean, People who write books have editors for a reason, right? Um, you write your English papers, I'm pretty positive that you weren't grading your own stuff. That's why. Uh, somebody that has the context. It definitely should not be focused on the developers, it should be focused on the solution that we are trying to provide. And I think it's absolutely, crucially, critically vital to your software development process. It's essential. And if, we, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, has anybody heard of DevOps in this room? Ooh, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, this piece up here, the four up, ah, you went too far ahead, my friend. Let's come back, code review is DevOps. But what I am saying is that that for us all, that fua bua, that is shared responsibility. Being about the context, that's collaboration, communication, you need to communicate with other people on the team. And if it is focused on the solution, the solution as a software developer is our product. It is not necessarily our project. That is DevOps culture. And that's what I mean by code review is DevOps. At the very least, promoting code review is promoting DevOps. These are icons I created myself, most of them. I didn't create the glasses, but everything else I made. So visibility, Quality, speed, resilience, collaboration, continue with improvement. When I tell you I loved hearing people talk about pull requests for the lightning talks, loved, I'm on it. Let's talk about how these things factor in with your code review. And you'll see my lovely little icons throughout my slides. So benefits of reviewing code. This is a collaborative learning experience. So this is part of your visibility. Why? Because you have eyes on this code. It is out there for everyone who's in the code base to take a look at. If your pipelines are written in your YAML file, your YAML file is hopefully maybe located in your repository, you can go and take a look at it. Your teammate can go and take a look at it. It is clearly out there available for everyone. Um, when I say rapid onboarding, let's talk about it, because I saw that we have several, something that you might want to know. So for my more mid-senior people, how many of you write Greenfield code? What would be considered new projects? Man, you probably have the most fun job of us all. Writing something completely from scratch. The rest of us, we're writing code that some, we're like fixing stuff that somebody else has written. Or we're rewriting something that someone else wrote before us. Or maybe I wrote it, but still, it was a long time ago, right? It's legacy code. How long do you think that it takes the average developer to get caught up to speed on something that they did not write? A, a couple weeks? How long? Continue it six months? Who else? It doesn't ever happen. It doesn't ever, it doesn't ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that the average is about six-ish months before you feel like you're comfortable in the code base, comfortable enough to start going in, breaking stuff, picking it up, putting it down, you know where stuff is. I work at VML, and we mentioned it is a global branding and marketing agency, which means I work on client work, and so my contracts are three to six months. Guess who does not have time to take six months to get to know the code base? That's us, right? That's us. We, so I don't have that time. What I do, though, is I review code. So whatever comes into the code base, I put my eyes on it. That lets me know what are we fixing, what are we adding, where are the helper functions, because oh my gosh, helper functions, I love those. Please make my life easier. And I have taken my own onboarding down to, I can get pretty comfortable in about, for me, about two weeks. Most people it's more like two to six weeks, but still, that's way better than six months. Way better than six months. So I like rapid onboarding, I like knowledge sharing. Um, this is also about reinforcing industry and company-wide standards. 
what we do at VML. We have a um, post this most recent merger, we have about 30,000 employees globally right now and about 9,000 of us are technologists. And that runs everything from like software development, mobile, um, mobile app development, uh, DevOps engineers, creatives that are doing our UX and UI design, also our analysts, all fall under that realm. That's a third of the company. We're like a whole little boutique tech shop, right? So we like to reinforce standards across what we're doing because what we do not compromise on, if you can get fast, you can get good, and you can get cheap, we do not compromise on good at all. It's got to be a high quality product. So we can tweak, you only get two. We can tweak, you know, good and cheap. It's not going to be fast. And we can do like good and fast, but that's definitely not cheap. And the way that we do that is we reinforce some of those standards. So like I touch um, something called Adobe Experience Manager. It's a, it's a content management system, a CMS for usually a Fortune 500 company because the average small business is not going to buy AEM. They don't, it's, it's, it's a major, like, big enterprise type solution. And I do Java backed models for these custom components. I will extend what comes out of the box and sometimes I will just write my own, uh, depending on what the client needs. And we have standards for that. We have a way that we work. We have a way that we deliver that get, allows us to hit things like accessibility and scalability and flexibility. We also do pattern and anti-pattern matching. Like I don't want to see the dependency array have stuff in it that it doesn't need. I don't want it to be dependent upon a whole object when only one thing has changed. But that's something that I know with my context. If I was to come and ask Jason, he might not know that yet. It's possible. You said four months? Yeah, so it's possible. You might not know that yet. But that's, a te that's something that he can learn through that code review process. And I'm so glad you mentioned that you've been doing pull requests. I mean, it's all the snaps, sir. So collaborative learning, another way that we do and enforce collaboration and communication is that we communicate on the pull request itself. You know how people like to say, hey, Michael, I've got a quick question about this code you wrote over here um, on your PR. Take that convo back to the pull request, because I guarantee you that that person is not the only person with the question. They're just the only person that asked, and they were too shy to do it. Take it back so that everybody has an opportunity to learn, because maybe what they're asking about could have been done better, or maybe you had a reason for why you wrote it the way that you did, and everybody needs to know that. The ways that we encourage engaging on the pull request is that you know, if you don't know what it does, ask a question. Why am I so big on asking questions? It's the way that a lot of us learn. <laughs> a lot of us learn by asking questions. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of self-driven, but I'm not self-driven enough to just do it all on my own, not when I have somebody to ask. Please help me. And what I have found a lot in the tech space is that if I go and I ask what it does, most people are proud of what they do and they are very, very happy to tell you. Very, very happy to show you how it works. I love finding some cool stuff in a pull request. Like, how does that work? I've never seen that before. Request a change. If you see something that is going to be detrimental to the code base, or you see something that is going to maybe, um, I was making sure it was still up there. Uh, <laughs> if you see something that is going to be detrimental to your client, like maybe you saw somebody set a focus outline ring to zero. That's an accessibility no-no. I would request a change. The other things that we do is we just leave a comment. And that comment could be anything, right? Like I could say, hey, Camille, you're going to need this um, on this ticket that's coming up. So I'm just tagging you here as a bookmark. Somebody mentioned tags in their talks and how they tag their conversations. And I was like, yes, I do that stuff. So when I want to ask a question, I just preface it with this exact bracket capitalized question. That's right in my comment, right after my name, and it opens up and just says question. And I ask my question. We also have a team norm to where we don't leave, you, don't merge, you do not merge code with open questions. Questions must be answered, must be answered. Um, blockers. <laughs> If it is something that I, like I said, if it's detrimental to the code, it's gotta stop, it's gotta be changed. 
I'll put a blocker on it. If it's just a change request, because maybe it's just the way that we, you know, we've aligned to this particular standard, we've made an architectural decision about what we're going to implement, how we're going to implement it, and the formatting, then, hey, change request, you know, we'd like to see this change. But it's not gonna stop the show. A NIT definitely is stopping nothing. NITs for me are things that are more based upon personal preference than they are on critical performance um, or consistency or maintainability, right? NITs are, are those little, yeah, you know, I kind of don't like semicolons. Well, you can ES lint that, right? You know, throw that in the letter. I, I like tabs, I like spaces. I personally don't care. <laughs> throw, it in a, throw it in a letter, I'll prettier it, whatever. The other things that we do, like I said, mention a comment, I just bracket comment just like this. Um, so a quick story about something like this, right? And I mentioned that we do not leave open questions and we don't leave open change requests. Like something has to be commented back. Tell you a story. There was a um, developer when I was getting started uh, who was doing like null checks backwards. Like that's probably one of my pet peeve nits. I just love consistency. I love consistency. I also like aligning to industry standards, oh my gosh. But when I check for null in Java, I have some variable bang equals null, right? Checking that it does not equal null. Um, this particular developer reversed it. So it was null bang equals some variable. And I said, hey, do you mind if we change this so that it can be you know, consistent with the rest of the stuff? And you know what he did, y'all? He merged the dog on pull request and didn't even answer the question, didn't even respond to me. Didn't respond at all. I was like, well, maybe we had a deadline or something. I mean, it's not, it's not a performance issue per se. But the very next pull request that this person submitted again had no bang equals some variable. And then I kid you not, three to five lines later, some variable bang equals null that he just wrote. And I was like, hold on now. I was like, at least pick away. Pick one or the other. You can't do both of them at the same time. You just introduced. I was like, can we please just make these match? And um, I was like, could we, you know, let's do, the, do it the way that it is in the rest of the code base. And this time, my, my, it was like, he was like one of the leads on the team, right, at that point, because I was not a lead at that time. Uh, he said, so I saw that you asked this question on the last PR and I just closed it because, you know, I was like, no, that's just a, a nit. But since you keep asking about it, I'm going to address it now. Excuse me? I, I didn't, I was like, the tone, sir. I was like, I was just asking for consistency in your code base. And that was a pretty like harsh experience from somebody who's supposed to be leading the team, right? Like it felt, felt bad. How many people have experienced somebody being belittled on a code, on a code reel? That is not the place for that. It's not about me. But I felt that that was an attack against me, right? It sounded like it felt like it in a tone. I had to like copy. I was like, hey, manager. I was like, am I reading this wrong? I was like, I feel offended, but I don't know if I should be. And, you know, we ended up, me and that lead, we ended up talking it out, right? We talked about it. He's more used to front end code, not necessarily back end code. I was like, well, I'm excellent at back end. Let me help you. And so once we had that, we did come, had that come to Jesus moment. And it, things got better for us after that. But that was like a, clearly something I remember. And I keep that in my memory banks. One of the ways to fight against those types of things. Oh, yeah, come on. Um, oh, Mike. I will project, I swear. They, but if people, okay, I'll repeat. Go ahead. Blocker, yes, okay. So the question is, can I explain what I mean by a blocker? What would be a blocker? So for me, a blocker is some sort of introduction into the code base that we absolutely should not do and should not move forward with pulling this code into our code base. It's something that might take down production. It's something that would go against our architectural constraints because people pick frameworks for a reason. You have processes for a reason. 
say for instance, picking a third party uh, JavaScript library, right? You pick your third party JavaScript library, you have about three or four different options. Well, I say three or four, you have about three or 400 options for <laughs> a React-based date picker. One of them has your color scheme already in place, but you know it only has 2,000 downloads. One of them has a million 5,000, a million 500 downloads and users. It's got like 11 active, 11 to 20 so active issues, and its last pull request was merged maybe yesterday, right? And then you've got something that's like, oh, look, it's got our color scheme, and I can like make all these things tab, even though they're radio buttons, and I should be using my arrows and not my tabs for radio buttons. And the last time that it got pushed to was in 2021. Which one do you pick or not pick? B. You, you're gonna pick B? Yeah, we're picking B because we have the least work to do. But who's gonna maintain it? I'm not. <laughs> but they have a whole big, huge like warning sign that says, hey, this code is not being actively maintained. That's a security issue. Because how many things have changed since 2021? I learned React in 2017, and by the time I used it again in 2020, that junk had hooked. It's like, what's a use effect? What do you mean? I've never seen that before because I had been doing C -sharp .net Python. And meanwhile, React's just over here, just turning into a teenager, going off to college, starting a business, you know, growing up. So those types of things, though, would be a blocker. So something that would be a detriment that you can spot off top. Detriment to your code base goes against your architectural decisions, goes against your other processes in place. Mm -hmm. And I do reject pull requests. Sure do. Sure do. So when I talk illities, in DevOps there's a whole bunch of illities. I've listed some of them up here, but I've also listed some, some other illities. So like sustainability and scalability, uh, maintainability, flexibility, readability, and I made up some like functionability because functionality and functionability to me are two different things. I wanna know if it works, and I wanna know if it works how it was intended to work because it's not enough that it just works. Yes, I can click this button, but does it actually do what we said it's supposed to do? And if I click this button over here, does it trigger this other button? Why? Why? So these are things that I check for. Um, and I check for them within the context of my own experience. So this is the way that we look for those illities. What does it do on the pull request? If you don't know what it does, what should you do? Huh? No, you shouldn't reject it. You should ask a question. Ask a question. If you don't know what it does, you should ask a question. And the developer that wrote it should know what it does if they wrote it. Because we aren't, we are absolutely are not just going and copy and pasting code from ChatGPT, right? We know exactly what, dot RF, what dash RF might do. Or do we? If you have been just copying and pasting code straight from any of these sources, whether it's ChatGPT or Stack Overflow or some other random blog website, please make sure that you are going through and doing this safely. Make sure you go and look up what that script does. Don't just drop it in the code base. You could be dropping every single table. And that's worse than taking down prod. You took down the data. Took down the data. Let's not do that. So ask what it does and whether or not the names make sense. I don't know about y'all, but like naming variables is one of the easiest things to do in the world. I mean, who doesn't love a good Optimus Prime does the thing? <laughs> Optimus Prime, Transformer, okay, he's Transformer something, but what is the thing? Would you in six months know what the thing is? How about you in six weeks? How about me like yesterday? I sure don't know what it was. I don't know, I don't know. I've already forgotten. It was clever, but it's better to be clear. I would much rather have you give me a whole sentence than something cheeky so that I can find it later and understand what it does when I'm reading through the code. Is it following standards? You know how I lie, we already talked about standards. And are we impacting things like accessibility? The only thing that you really need to do with accessibility, well the main thing, not the only thing, the main thing, use semantic HTML. It handles about 75% of what you need just by using a header, a main, a footer, 
just by using a semantic, the HTML button, using sections and asides, it's your navigation. Don't put styles on heading tags like H3s and H2s. H2 is not a style. H2 is a navigational element. It tells me where I am on the page. Style a class, a pie said class to the H2. I can make an H2 look like an H1. I can make an H1 look like an eyebrow. It's not about the style, it's about the location on the page. Um, does it have tests? Oh my goodness, does it have tests? Hopefully, yes. Does it need tests? Mm, I'm gonna say about a solid 95% of the time it might need tests. Only time I think something might not need tests for me particularly in Java is doing getters and setters. Why? Because I know that they have already tested the functionality of me using this one component to get data. So I don't test that. I let Lombok and some other stuff handle my boilerplate stuff. And I test things that I change. I test logic. I test, yes, I got the name from this person, but if I wanted all lowercase, did it actually do lowercase for me as expected? Did it put it where I wanted it to go? Does it look like what we need it to look like? That, those are the kinds of things that I do as far as like testing. And I will stop code from going in without tests. Hopefully we're doing test-driven development, but I know that doesn't always happen. So if there are no unit tests, it does not get merged until said unit tests come in. And is this a new wheel? How many times have you seen somebody recreate some stuff that you knew existed already? I'm gonna say, I can see it on your face. You've seen, you've seen this several times. Yes, team, no new wheels over here. Why are we rewriting wheels if we don't have to? If I wrote a helper function, I would love to share it with you. Please go use it. And that would be one of the changes that I request. Hey, I saw that you did this, but we already have a lovely, shiny helper function. I see that you wrote a new modal, but we already have a custom modal. I see you wrote a brand new button, but we already have a button. Oh, well, you said you needed a submit button this time. I'd love to tell you something about React. On Figma, or not on Figma, like think about your favorite websites. How many buttons are on your pages? Back button, submit button, close button, continue button, open button, link, that's a button. There's probably like a solid 15 different types of buttons across most websites. Would you create 15 different button components? I wouldn't, I mean, if you do, it's perfectly fine, I want you to know that. But I also would like to introduce you to another way. You can create one button, make it fully accessible, and then tell it what it should look like. Tell it where it should go, what it should do. Pass it through, like context and props, to the button. Ta-da, one component, you now have a button factory. So I'm team no new wheels, and we do that via code review. I would be able to catch these things because, hey, I know we've got that component already. Please use it. But Rhea, all these reasons. I'm a front-end dev. I don't know how to review back-end code. I'm a back-end dev. I don't need to review front-end code. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. If you are using, if you're a back-end, or even if you're a full-stack dev, right? If you have back-end stuff that you're writing that interacts with the front-end in some kind of capacity, it is to your betterment to figure out what it is that the front-end actually needs, how it actually works, because the way that we think it should work isn't how they expect it to work. So it's important. Put your eyes on the code so that you know where to go look. I'm back all the way up into the screen, y'all. I'm just walking around, just walking around. What about the, the argument that it takes too long, Rhea? You know, it takes me, you know, PRs, they just sit there for days. Why do they sit there for days? Have y'all heard of team norms and expectations? Set an expectation. I have an expectation of most of my teams that at the beginning of the day, we are going to make sure that everything that's open has been addressed so that the dev team that worked on it, if they need to make changes, they can go ahead and make those changes earlier in the day and we can continue on. I don't like old PRs. I don't like them to be super stale. You can do a draft PR in GitHub. I love those. I don't know if that functionality exists in Bitbucket, but I love it in GitHub. Um, let me see. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm glad you're here. I'll show you what you're doing. And we paired on it. I get that often. Hey, we had two people already look at this. That's enough. I told y'all earlier how I feel about it. If you write the code, you're not the reviewer for that code, or you're not the approver for that code, for sure. And we can put that in place. 
with things like rule sets and policies in GitHub. And uh, pairing on it is not a, that's, unless you're the only two people in the whole company, on the whole, they, it's just y'all, y'all get a pass. But everyone else, no. Somebody else should take a look at it. And this is definitely my face several times. As we're getting stuff started, right, it's a little bit slow at the beginning, first sprint, second sprint, maybe even third sprint as we're working out the kinks. But I guarantee as people start looking at the code and they start watching the conversations and they start seeing where stuff lives, they start looking at the patterns that you are enforcing, guess whose code gets better? Guess whose test coverage is up? Guess whose stuff is more performant? And how easy is it to find and fix a bug? Somebody says, hey, this doesn't quite work how we expected. You know exactly where it is. If you write code, review the code. All right, so the question about getting better, right? How do you get better? How do you get better? How do you get better? Well, practice, 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 practice. That's it. Honestly, I think that you should develop a process. Um, your process is gonna be different than mine, but you should have one in place because it kind of gives you that muscle memory, that repeatability, let's do this. I think that you should invite critique because if you are a senior dev, if you are a team lead, you are the person that is helping someone who is new to this, invite them to critique you. Why? Because imposter syndrome is a thing. It is real. I don't know how many times I have had a new dev say, well, I don't feel like I can review your code. You're, you know, you're the lead. And I'm like, you're the one that just got out of school and just learned all the new hotness. Please, how can I make this better? Also, I, I mentioned some of y'all earlier, <laughs> walking around, I have a whole degree in physics. And when I think in terms of like high level math, there's a, there's a thing such as being too much up here. And it gets worse the higher you get. You're too far away from the code and we start thinking in, how can I architect this solution? <laughs> and instead of taking three Legos and building the thing, we have now gone to go get like the connects. We've got the extra spigots and we didn't need all that. If someone that's more junior needs said, well, why did you do it that way? That's a fantastic question. You should be able to explain it to them. And sometimes you will find, you know what? I don't know why I did it that way. How would you have done it? And their way is better. It has happened more often than, than not. Please review the code. And also celebrate progress of your team because we celebrate all the other small stuff, right? As soon as you get it working, yes, it's working. As soon as you get people to start reviewing code consistently, yes. Thank you, Sam, I appreciate you. So this is my process. I'm gonna to try to get through it as quickly as possible. The process part is a little bit longer. Mind you, it doesn't take me as long to explain it to you. Um, I mean, it, it takes me longer to explain it to you than it takes me to actually do this. So here we go, bear with me. My process, and I say it's a process because it's my process, but like TSA, I'm gonna pre-check it. I'm gonna give it a yay or nay up front because there's some things that I'm looking out for. One, this, PR template and the ticket. I want, so our PR templates have like a link to the ticket number and I can just click it, go pop open the ticket, see what the change is supposed to be, instant context switch. Makes it easy for me. I can, we have a list that says, hey, does this have test? If it doesn't have test, where are my tests? And so I will go and ask, hey, this needs test, when are they coming? And I'll review it after that. Um, Something else I look for in the ticket is just making sure this stuff is applicable because it's very easy for Scoop to creep on in. How many times have you seen people that are team refactor? Well, let me ask first. Are you team refactor all the things? Team leave the code better than we found it. Okay, leave the code better than we found it. I love that, but I like it when it's in scope. You cannot refactor every single thing all at once. If your ticket is on buttons, I wanna see stuff that's buttons. Please make the button code as good as it can be. If the code you're touching is not directly related to your button in some capacity, why are we over here fudging around with the cart when this is buttons, right? It's too big. Um, I look at, is this a solution to that issue? That's applicability right there. Does this solution fix the problem? And how many files are changed? And I don't know about y'all, but in my Java development, 
When I create a custom backend model for a component, I know it takes me roughly about 17 to 21 files. If someone is putting in a PR for a custom backend component and it is like 53 files, whose antennas are up? It's mine. I'm like, hey, what's happening here? Got a little few too many files. And we try to keep them pretty much bite-sized, right? So I don't want to see anything larger than that unless you are scaffolding from scratch. Like, I don't, oh, Lord. Because who's going to read 83 lines? Do they really, I'm 83 files. I mean, I might, but it's not going to get done today. It's not going to get done tomorrow either. I'll just have to just, it's going, whew. If you want stuff to go in faster, it needs to be smaller. Um, and are they in scope? We mentioned that, right? So hopefully I gave you a thumbs up and we've moved along to reading it. When I read code, I am looking for my small changes first because I like to celebrate my wins. I like checklists and GitHub is that little viewed checkbox now. They didn't have that five years ago. The little checkbox is viewed and I'm like, yes, I can just start collapsing stuff, right? Love those. I look for the small stuff. The next thing that I start doing is I lean into my own expertise, my own experiences. I told you I identify as a backend developer. I, I, I love logic. So I should be able to figure out whether or not I can find your variables that you added and what they do in JavaScript. It's pretty much the same. Um, I also have a fairly decent amount of experience with accessibility issues. So if your carousel is mysteriously missing arrows, I will point that out. If your button does not, if your button is like an X button and I don't see the ARIA label that says close with the X because X is not a thing to somebody who can't see it, they don't know what it's doing, I will point that out. And if I see something that I'm going, that's going to, you know, that needs a change, I'm going to what? What am I going to do? Ask questions. You were so funny, sir. He said ask questions, y'all, for those of y'all listening in. No, I'm going to request a change. <laughs> so close. I tried. Look, so close. You get it. I, I don't know. I was going to, I'll give you, you try. <laughs> I also check for my illities. Um, I check for questions if I have them. And we don't close questions without having some sort of answer. And, and the conversation happens on the code review. The next thing I do is I try to build it, pull it down, build it. Very, very easy. The same way that you pull down most code. Same, same thing. Can I build this branch locally? Why do I want to build it locally? Because it works on Joe's box is not enough. Because it works on Amy's box is not enough. Does it work on my box? Something that we found recently, um, well, recently-ish, on this most recent project of mine, uh, I mentioned date pickers. Has anybody ever had to do time conversion? Ooh, isn't that one pesky little beast? So we had the date picker. We had something else on the page that had like dates and times and stuff. We're getting dates and times from the server. And you can imagine the shenanigans that we had to deal with, with converting from time to time to time just to display in this other time zone. And it worked for everyone in Michigan. <laughs> And me and the guy in Cali we were like, why do our tests keep failing? Something that we wouldn't have found out until they pushed it to Pride and it hit the server that lives in the central region and it wouldn't have worked, right? So collaboration, can I build it locally? Let me help you out and test this. Does the thing work? We talked about that. And did this change impact anything it shouldn't? Well, that change impacted my ability to actually get through that because I couldn't select the right day. Every time I clicked on the day, it went to like yesterday at midnight because midnight today on the East Coast is 11 p.m. Central Time, the previous day. Could not select the right day to save my life. Can I break it? Yeah, well, it was already broken. I ain't need to break it. But this is the other part, right? Like if it looks good to you, and this is specifically for my more junior, you entry level developers, if it looks good to you, approve that pull request. Don't worry about whether or not you got it right. Don't worry about whether or not you caught every single thing. What do you, what do you expect if you have only been on this job for a year? What do you expect if you are brand new to this code base? You expect to catch it all? Like it's Pokemon? 
<laughs> There's no way. There's no way. And personally, as a senior dev, I do not, I don't approve pull requests until after at least half my team has looked at it. Like, I don't go in. And mainly it's because I don't want to influence them and say, oh, well, she found something. Or, oh, she didn't find something. I want to give you the opportunity. Look through it. Read through it. Figure out how you feel about the code. I'm expecting to see questions if you have them. Approve that pull request if you don't have any questions. And don't feel bad if somebody else finds something. They just had a little bit more context than you. And that's OK. It's perfectly OK. Some inspiration and celebration and things to try um, that we use. I like updating your team norms. If you have not had a norming session with your team, this is to my mid and more. And even the entry level developers, you can ask about team norms. Hey, what are our norms? Can we have a norming session? Can we talk about expectations? Because holy moly, trying to go into a job and not actually have the expectations, how can I exceed expectations? I don't know where the goalposts are. Ask. Get it set up. Um, one of our norms, like I mentioned, was reviewing code at the beginning of the day. Like make sure there's nothing that needs work early in the day. That keeps you from going all day with a team just stuck, doing nothing. Another norm is, hey, if you submit a pull request and you haven't reviewed any pull requests before you pick up a next ticket, you need to go review some code. You have to, this is, this is a give a penny, take a penny type system. It'll take it, take at least one. Um, specifically tag your team. I do this a lot. I will tag every single person that I think might benefit from looking at this code. Whether they, I knew the people that might have touched it last. Hey, you did this earlier. I saw you were in here earlier. Hey, come take a look and make sure I'm not breaking something that I don't know about. And I will tag people that, hey, you said you wanted to learn a little bit more about React because you do a lot of Java. This is one of those good types of pull requests for you. Come on, come tag, come tag in on my PR. I have office hours with a recurring views, review session. We do some group code reviews, but during my office hours, um, what we do is I will just like talk out, I'll, I'll take an open PR and I will literally just walk through my process out loud. I'll sit there and be like, okay, so this is the PR, this is what the title says, it says it's this ticket, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and see that they link it, great, let me pop this ticket open. Um, all right, this is what the change is about, this is what they said that their change does, they gave me some screenshots because it was visual, fantastic, great, let's continue on, start reading through. And I walk through just like that. And it's like stream of conscious. Um, and I do positive reinforcement. So like I said, shout out Sam, Joe, Jill, all of you. Quick recap, these are the things that I want you to remember about the code review process. When somebody asks you, why should we even do this? Well, it helps our devs learn the code base faster, which means that it's improving your team's time to value. That's an important metric. Remember that, time to value. It's not enough that I pulled a really great person, like, yeah, we love this person. Not just that, we love them, and we were able to get them ramped up quickly so they can start contributing. Who doesn't love to be able to contribute effectively, right? Okay, and so then promoting code quality and your healthy code base, because no spaghetti code, it increases your velocity by minimizing your duplication. You do get faster, and your team is more resilient. They can find stuff and fix it faster. It prevents architectural decay and rework, because I hate seeing tickets five times, and this is a vital shared responsibility. It's on all of us, all of us. If you write code in that code base, you are a gatekeeper, or you should be. Don't just let up any old raggedy code in your house. Somebody's gotta come back to it and sort it out. If you write code, review the code. I've got resources for you for later. Um, it, they'll have my slides. And y'all have been awesome. I don't know if I have time for questions. I might have gone over. I do have a question. Ooh, crack it. All right. <laughs> it's related to timing of uh, PRs. In the past, I had a situation on a team where there would be an engineer who puts up a PR, mm -hmm. first person to approve it, whether it was like one hour later, they like go ahead and merge it. Just oh, boom, right away. 
And then I had situations where myself, as soon as I put up a PR, I'm starting a new branch on a new feature. I'm kind of stepping away from that PR and minding my business. So my PRs would hang around for a day or two. And because of that, I would get um, like maybe four or five engineers to review it. And so now I fix it, push it back up, they maybe come back and say, oh, that's good or no, let's change this. And so it would be a lot of back and forth. And I realized like, gosh, my PRs are taking about three, four days to be merged, but I'm having a lot more eyes on it. So I felt conflicted because I'm like, well, the other engineer, get one approved, his PR goes in like very quickly. Whereas mine is like sitting around for three, four days and I was feeling just bad about it. Like, man, am I doing something wrong? Like, is my code really trash? Like, God, I got a lot of changes to make. Like, so it's like, is there a healthy balance between do you just go with the first approve and just keep on trucking or do you need to let it marinate and get some eyes on it? So I love your question because this is the problem across so many different dev teams. It's the reason why PR is a trigger word for a lot of people because they have had this sort of experience. They've been traumatized by the process. I think that what you just told me sounds like the expectations for the team are not set. And if they were, then the one that had the one review wouldn't have gone in with just one approver. And yours would not have sat around for that many days. Uh, if you are working in GitHub, they do have rule sets, they have policies. You can set code owners on the code base so that um, maybe two people need to at least review the code before the button will go green, or maybe two, three people need to review it minimum and one of them needs to be on that code owner list. That should probably be your team lead. Um, and if you have a team lead, because I've definitely seen some teams that are all lieutenant to no captain. Uh, but with that though, there's, there's these policies that you put in place, these, these little checks and gates that will leave that PR open long enough for it to get the appropriate number of eyes on it. And the person that wrote it cannot be their own approver. You can't be your own approver. So for, some, for my teams, we like to set up a list of code owners. There are multiple code owners on the team, but they're all mostly more senior level developers, right? In the event that one of us goes on vacation, the rest of the code can still get in. I have started to introduce, hey, you senior code reviewers, you were not the first ones to review. If there's no reviews on it, go bug the team. You can drop a link directly to open PRs, all open PRs in your little project or in your code base, it depends, I don't know, you can get them all. But that's where I would say, so if yours is sitting, if, you, if your PR sat for a day, nothing happened on it, get squeaky. You do not put oil on something that is just swinging freely, right? It's gotta be squeaky in order to get some oil on it. So I would say be squeaky, pipe up, say, hey, I've got this PR out here. I don't know if you all are dropping links, but you can like take a link of your exact code review, drop it in Slack or Teams or whatever it is that you use to communicate. Say, hey, this PR is out here and I would like to get your eyes on it to approve it. And maybe if you have particular questions for yourself, like, hey, take a look at how I wrote this function. So that they are starting to like, oh yeah, you really do want me to look at this, not just to prove it. Um, for the ones that go in too fast, I would say, y'all need a gate. It shouldn't have happened that way. It shouldn't have happened that way. One, I don't think that one person is enough unless there's like only three of y'all on the team and that one did not write the code, right? That, that's, that's the only time that I think that that is something that should happen. But as far as for knowledge transfer, nobody saw that. Nobody saw what that code was. I mean, they can go back and look, but by now it's already out there. It's already out there. So I think that your process needs to change a little bit. Y'all need some norms, y'all need some expectations. And uh, yeah, three to four days is too long. It's a battle that I had to fight hard. But now most of the people that I come in contact with, they already know exactly what I expect of them. I lay it down up front. As soon as they rotate onto the team, hey, let me tell you about our pull request process. This is how we do it. This is what we expect. We expect your engagement, and we expect your engagement in a timely manner. You do not pick up a new ticket unless you have already reviewed some code. Yes. And, oh. 
Could you just describe a little bit uh, more in detail the uh, group review process and demo days item that you had and we kind of blew by? I'm just kind of oh, curious yeah. how that kind of actually plays out in practice. Yeah, okay, so group code reviews and demo days. So like a demo day is like you get to bring something cool you worked on and you show it off, right? This isn't necessarily inviting a whole bunch of critique, but this is giving the person that wrote it an opportunity to walk through their code process in a way that other people are now following along and walking through the code process. And then for some of our group code reviews that we do, we'll like pick a PR, not to pick it apart or anything, just go and look at open PRs. And we're going through, we're looking at it, say, hey, what does this do? You know, what do you think that this function does? How can we go and find this? So they're looking at how to walk through the code. And then at the end, well, do you see any opportunities to make this better? What would you do differently? Is there anything that you'd do differently? Sometimes the answer is, well, no, I wouldn't do anything differently. This seems like it's solid in line. And it's just a, let's go through this together, but it's more so not led by just me. It's led by someone else. And everybody gets an opportunity to do that. Depending on, um, it, depending on the, the size of the PR, it depends on how long that takes, but we time box about 30 minutes. It's just a quick 30 minute learning session. And somebody's code gets reviewed at the same time. So for the group code reviews, we, we did them once a week, but that was because people, you know, you got work to do the rest of the week, but we wanted to have this kind of like learning session. So it's a dedicated time to learn more about how to get better at doing code review. And it's not something that we have to do daily because I'm hoping that there aren't that many PRs open every day. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you found something that you can take home.